All right. It, uh... Hey, buddy. It is with complete sincerity and nothing but honesty in my heart that I can say I'm not getting paid extra to do this at all. <laughs> Contrary to whatever the uh, announcement video says, and, and I mean, seriously, they're going to have me preach on the day that we're all going to eat after this? I mean, like, that's, that's not fair, but I'll make you guys a deal. If you act like you're engaged with what's happening, right, we'll, we will try to finish early. And now I know that you have been to churches before where the preacher says we're going to finish early and it's only like 15 minutes late instead of 30 minutes late. But good news for you guys. I'm not a preacher. So, uh, who I am, though, is uh, my name is Evan. I am the discipleship minister here, and uh, I really am excited to talk today because we're going to talk about the idea of celebration. Um, celebration is a really important part of our church family, and we wanted to continue to create a culture of celebration within our church. Now, we really do have a lot to celebrate, right? We, we talked earlier about... Um, the gift of Jesus, right? And we can honestly probably all go home after that because that is the greatest thing to celebrate that we have, right? Awesome. You guys are catching on. Um, but for our church family specifically, we are in this season of building, right? We have this renewed focus on our mission to reach the next person for Jesus. And that's something to celebrate. Also behind me, you see all these cards on our prayer walls. We are today finishing a season of prayer and fasting, prayers that we have been able to lift up for our city. And that is also something that we get to celebrate. So what I wanted to do today is just talk a little bit about this idea of celebration. Every time I think about celebration, I think about this quote from Andy Stanley, and it says this, what gets celebrated gets repeated. What gets celebrated gets repeated. Now, I feel like that's a pretty simple phrase, but it carries a lot of weight, right? Think about when you're raising kids or when you're like training a puppy. So there are a lot of odd similarities between the two. But like when you have a behavior that you want to see repeated, what do you do? You, you praise that behavior, right? You celebrate that behavior. And so it, this concept of what gets celebrated gets repeated lets us realize that Celebration is an important thing, and not just to celebrate, but to celebrate the right things. So I want you to take this idea of what gets celebrated, gets repeated. I want you to hold on to it for just a second. We're going to switch gears. I promise we're going to come back, but I want you to hold on to that, all right? So if you've been with us for the past few weeks, you know that we have been in the story of Nehemiah. Now, the story of Nehemiah is a really neat story in the Old Testament about how a man named Nehemiah went back to the city of Jerusalem to help rebuild the walls. Now, we have been studying that because we, too, are in a season of building in our church family, and we've been able to draw several parallels from the story of Nehemiah to where we are right now in our church family here at Clear Creek. Now, what's interesting is that if you take a step back from the story of Nehemiah and you look at see where it sits kind of in the history of Jerusalem itself, you're going to see that the season of building that Nehemiah is in is actually just part of this repetition of a season of building followed by a season of building followed by a season of building. And this is what I mean. So starting roughly 1000 BC, right, you have uh, the city of Jerusalem is conquered by King David. About 40 years later, his son Solomon builds the temple. 721 BC, the city expands. 586 BC, the temple is destroyed, which is sad. 516 BC, uh, the temple is rebuilt. 445 BC, the walls are rebuilt. 37 BC, Herod modifies the temple. 70 AD, the Romans destroy the temple. And then 135 AD, the whole city is kind of rebuilt in the image of Rome. And so on, and so on, and so on, for like the next 1,886 years to present. I think you get the point. The Israelites were continually in a season of building that was followed by another season of building. And so I think it's true for us that when we think about where we are right now, while we are on this earth, there's always going to be another time to build, right? And so it's not like we can be in the middle of what we're doing now and we finish it and it's great and we can all just go home and do nothing. There's always going to have another time to build, right? 
So if you think about what I was talking about earlier, this idea of what gets celebrated gets what? Repeated. What gets celebrated gets repeated. If you take that idea and you kind of marry it with, with the thought of there's always going to be another time to build. You kind of have the thesis of, of where we're going today, and that's this. What we celebrate during this season of building affects what happens during our next season of building. What we celebrate during this season of building has a direct impact on what happens during our next season of building. So again, what we celebrate matters. So what I wanted to do for the rest of our time today is just kind of go through and talk about, hey, what are some of those things? What are some of the things that we can celebrate now as a church family that is going to set us up better in the future for our next time of building? And the first thing is this. We want to celebrate legacy over longevity. Legacy over longevity. So longevity is basically how long you live, right? Legacy, though, is what lives on after you. Uh, you can think about it this way. Longevity kind of focuses in on, hey, what are things going to be like while I'm still a part of it? Whereas legacy focuses on, what are things going to be like whenever I'm completely out of the picture? And so I, I love what uh, Paul says in the New Testament. So Paul, uh, he's a guy that wrote a good portion of the New Testament. And most of his writing was letters to churches, letters to uh, specific people sometimes. Uh, often they were his mentees, right? He was a mentor. And so this letter that he sends to a guy named Timothy, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he, he says this. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. All right, I want you guys to take like 10 seconds, read through this verse again, see how many generations, one to the next to the next, you can identify in this one verse. Are you ready? And go. So those awkward 10 seconds of my life. Okay, so... Uh, hold up, hold up your hand. How many do you think you found? I see a bunch of numbers. I see a lot of threes, a lot of fours. All right, so let's go through it together. And the things you, so that's Timothy, have heard me say, so that's Paul, in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to what? To teach others four generations in one simple verse and here's what i love about this right what paul is trying to get timothy to see is like listen man it is not about me it's not about you it's not even about the people that you are going to be teaching timothy i want you to be thinking about what are you doing right now that is going to help the people that come to know jesus long after you're even out of the picture and I love that. I love that forward thinking. I love the fact that Paul is willing to say, hey, listen, I may have to put a little preference aside here, but I'm not just going to focus on what this church that we're building is going to be like while I'm a part of it. I want to focus on what is this church going to be like for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. I think this idea is summed up really, really well by a guy named Walt Weaver a few years ago. He came in and spoke to a lot of the leaders here, and he said this. He said, what would it look like or what would you be willing to do to build a church that your grandkids loved to go to? And, and I really love that. Now, I don't have grandkids. I've heard that they're better than kids. Um, I don't really know how to test that, but I can understand where that comes from some days. Just kidding. Love you. Um, he's not even paying attention. It's okay. Um, <clears throat> but the idea here is this. What are we willing to do now? that is going to be better for the people that don't know Jesus, but will know Jesus someday. What are we willing to do as a church family? So the first thing, we want to celebrate legacy over longevity. Number two, we want to celebrate God's success over our success. 
Now, when you read that one, I, I hope that one feels like ridiculously obvious. Um, but here is the reason that I bring it up. I truly, truly believe that while we are in this season of building, there are going to be some absolutely amazing things happening in and around our church family. I really, really believe that. But with that, it is so important to know who the true hero of the story is. Right? And I think it's easy, I know it is for me, to always kind of want to be the hero of, of your own story. Right? You, know, if you think back to whenever you were a kid and you start putting yourselves in all these like ridiculous imaginary situations where you can come in at the last second. Like for me, I was playing sports, and so uh, it was often, you know, I have the ball with two seconds left in the game, and we're down by two, and I shoot the winning shot, right? And, and, and hopefully it goes in. At least in my head it went in. Um, but never, never in that instance that I think to myself, you know what would make this dream even better? Is if instead of me shooting, I passed it to somebody else. No, that's, that's not what we do, right? We normally like to make ourselves the hero of our own story. That's just a normal thing. Uh, I love what John says in the New Testament because he's kind of faced with the same situation, right? Um, and so I, I kind of want to set up the scenario for you. You've got John and Jesus and several people, and they have gone down to the river, and they're baptizing people, uh, which is a, an absolutely amazing thing, obviously. And so... John, at some point, gives this incredible testimony and is kind of pointing everyone to Jesus. And the second that he does that, nobody wants to come to John anymore to be baptized. They, they all want to go to Jesus. And so some of the people that came with John, they're like, listen, man, like, that was like, really nice of you and everything, but everybody's going over to be baptized by Jesus. Now nobody's coming to be baptized by you. Like, did you make the right choice here? And this is what he says, and I love what it was. He says, listen, you yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater and I must become what? Less. And I love that phrase right before that. That joy is mine. And it is now complete. John does a fantastic job his entire life of making sure people know who the real hero is to the story. So as, as we celebrate all the amazing things, and I truly, again, believe that there are going to be some awesome things happening here. It is important to put Jesus, to put God, the Holy Spirit, as the hero of our story. Because it's not about what we can do, right? It's not about what Clear Creek can do, as much as I love you guys. At the end of the day, it's absolutely about what God can do. All right, so we've got celebrating legacy over longevity. We have this idea of celebrating God's success over our own success. And then we have this. We want to celebrate the final build. It's like the final countdown from Rocky, except not even close at all. But we want to celebrate the final build. So I, for me at least, it feels like it's so easy to get stuck in this cycle of, man, all right, so, so we're just in this season of building just so that what we can go to another season of building and then another season of building, and then another season of building, and another season of building. Like, it feels like we might get stuck. And if you zoom out in the scope of human history, it doesn't really matter how far back you go and how much of a macro view you take of history. History tells us that, yeah, that's what's gonna happen. We're gonna move from one season of building to the next and to the next and so on and so forth except for one day. There's this awesome promise, and it's kind of tucked away. We read it earlier. But it's tucked away in the last book of the Bible, in the second to last chapter. And it starts in Revelation chapter 21, and this is what it says. 
It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, and I love this, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Because if this is not something to celebrate, I I don't really know what is. Because there is going to be a day when no wall is going to need to be rebuilt, no temple repaired, no road repaved, right? We're going to be able to put down our tools and lift our hands in worship to a merciful God. Amen. Right? And and that is something to celebrate. You know, I I think about how we started this series of Nehemiah and having a broken heart for a broken city. And that's reflected, I, I think, on these walls behind us. But here's something that I really don't want us to miss because I think it's so important. When you read the names on these cards, we're not lifting them up to God simply so that they can fill the seats of this worship center. We're not lifting their names up to God simply so that they can join us in our next season of building. Y'all, we're lifting these names up so that on the day when we don't have to build anymore, they are standing side by side with us, arm in arm, praising God. And that is exciting. It makes the effort worth it. It makes the change worth it. And it is absolutely worthy of celebration. So as we continue to move forward in this season of building, knowing that there's going to be another one after this, and then maybe another and another. We can trust our God in the fact that one day we will put down our tools and not just stand side by side with with the people on the wall, right? But with the people that they're going to reach and the people they're going to reach and the people they're going to reach. So I want to end this series uh, how we began it, and that's with prayer. So I want to ask you guys to stand And we want to lift up these names one more time and pray for our city. We want to pray for our friends and our neighbors and our family. We want to pray for our neighborhoods. We want to pray pray for the uh, the places that we work, the places that we play, for our schools, and for our leaders. So I want to ask you guys to, to bow your heads as our shepherds lift us up in prayer for our city. lift up our immediate family members and our neighbors who do not know you, that you will pour your spirit out on them and soften their hearts, that you will give us courage to serve and to speak and love your truth to your glory. We ask in your son's name, amen. This morning, we will be praying for our education system. Let's pray. Our Father, we want to bring our education system before your presence this morning. Our hearts are with our students from this area and worldwide who are being taught in so many different situations. We ask you to bless those who teach these students on a daily basis. Many of our congregation are teachers, administrators, coaches and counselors and other helpers. Thank you for their love for you and the students they teach. Our area is blessed with schools which teach about your son every day but also because our public schools have allowed students to study your written word through Bibles in the school. We pray that we can continue to bless that effort. 
Father, also help us to continue to bless our community and schools through school supplies and our snack pack program. We ask your blessings on all school leadership. Father, our desire is that through whatever avenue, our students see you and your son through your word and those that are with them to show your love and change the lives of students to become disciples of Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm this morning and we just uh, thank you for the people that are in our lives, where we work, where we play, and uh, just help us to have open minds that we can consider their needs and their need for you and help us to uh, not be timid, but to uh, open our eyes and our ears that we may look for those opportunities where we come in contact with people. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue this prayer, I would like to lift up our city leadership at this time. Please bow with me. Father, I just come to you and just want to take a moment to lift up the leaders um, here in our city. But before that, Father, just want to give you all the praise and glory as our ultimate ruler and as our king. But Father, as we pray for our city leaders, whether they are government leaders or leaders in our school systems or at our workplaces or organizations and community leaders, Lord, we just lift all of them up. And I just pray that you will bless them and lead them as they make decisions for um, this city. Um, I pray that they would know you, um, Lord, primarily and ultimately, that they would come to faith in you through Jesus so that they might make decisions that um, would honor and glorify you. But Lord, if, if these leaders are not believers, I pray that you will surround them with people in their lives who are believers and who can influence them for your purposes and kingdom in this city. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.